Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is Lathe Skills, a series of quick videos on getting started in machining. This is episode 21, Speeds and Feeds. Yes, the one everybody's been waiting for. This is a meaty topic, so let's go. Speeds and Feeds is a very complicated topic, and I think that's why you don't see a lot of really great videos or kind of quick summaries of this topic. Everybody always wants like a quick summary of speeds and feeds. Just tell me what to do, right? Okay, fine. Here's the numbers you should use. Got it? No? Don't go back and try to freeze frame your YouTube player because I'm going to show you where those numbers come from and how to get those numbers for you. You know, Machinery's Handbook devotes 100 pages to this topic and there's a reason why. There's a ton of nuance to it. Uh, however, there are some kind of rules of thumb and there are some shortcuts that I think hobbyists can take. And I'm going to show you, uh, you know, what happens when things go right. And we're going to push things to failure on my little machine. So that's going to get exciting. Stay tuned for that. The fundamental property that we're after here is surface speed. In the Imperial Machine Shop, we measure that in surface feet per minute, but that's a really stupid unit. The thing is, though, the units don't matter. We're ultimately after a spindle RPM, so it doesn't matter what we use to get there. It could be centimeters per decasecond, or King George's thumbs per fortnight. It doesn't matter. If, like most beginners, you frantically Googled around looking for some kind of guidance on speeds and feeds, mostly what you'll find are these charts of surface speed that people have produced. And, you know, they'll confidently state things like steel should be cut at 120 surface feet per minute. They'll have a little formula so you can convert your, the diameter of your part or your cutter into surface feet per minute, and that's all you need to know. The problem is that these charts are all varying degrees of wrong they all have a set of unspoken assumptions about your cutting conditions. So what I'm going to show you here is how to work forward from first principles to basically make your own chart for your particular machine. Now most of those homemade charts are getting their information from this section of Machinery's Handbook. And uh, so there's a series of tables in here for different materials. So here we're looking at 1018 mild steel. And uh, do you know the Brunel hardness of your mild steel? I bet you don't. But most people are assuming, you know, somewhere in this range here, 90 to 120 surface feet per minute for high speed steel. So, you know, this is where those numbers come from that you find in all those charts. However, what nobody ever seems to mention is that the tables in Machinery's handbook are calibrated for a 125 thou depth of cut and a 12 thou per revolution feed rate. Now, for the hobbyist, those are extremely aggressive numbers. Those are very unlikely to be numbers that your average hobbyist machines can achieve. Remember, Machinery's Handbook is a professional tool for professionals who have big machines and are trying to maximize production. So if you try and push your benchtop hobbyist machine to an eighth inch depth of cut, that's a quarter of an inch off the diameter on a direct read hand wheel, a quarter inch diameter reduction at 12 thou per revolution you're going to blow that machine up, so I hope you got the warranty. I think I can summarize this in that there are two basic ways that you can calculate speeds and fees. There's the correct way, and then there's the way that everybody, especially hobbyists, tend to actually do it. The correct way is a three-step process. Step one is to select your depth of cut. Now, this is generally dictated by uh, three things. It's dictated by the rigidity of your machine, the rigidity of your setup, and how much of a hurry that you're in. If you've got 200 thou to remove off a dimension, obviously you want to do that as quickly as possible so you're not standing around all day. Uh, for this exercise, we'll assume that your setup is as rigid as it can be for your machine. So you've got good tail support, you've got a good grip with your chuck, you know, all those sorts of things. So from there, it's really down to the material that you're cutting. Uh, you know, the most common hobbyist materials are going to be aluminum, brass, and steel. For aluminum and brass, they're very easy to cut. So 60, 70, 80 thou depth of cut, all you know, all within the realm of possibility. Now with steel, we're much more in the 40 thou depth of cut range, kind of at the upper limit. Uh, I don't typically get that aggressive with steel on my little machines. Uh, I tend to stick around, you know, 30 thou depth of cut or, uh, you know, 60, 60 to 80 thou uh, on the hand wheel for a direct read hand wheel. So step one, establish your depth of cut. Step two, is figuring out your feed rate. Now with larger machines with complicated transmissions or electronic lead screws or things like that, you may have a lot of choices on feed rate. However, with hobbyist benchtop machines like this, you're probably only gonna have one, two, or three choices here. So uh, this is typical of these benchtop machines. You're gonna have uh, change gears in here that are set up for specific feed rates. So there's, uh, on this particular machine, there are two sets of change gear options for power feeding. Uh, so there's a coarse set and a fine set. The coarse set is incredibly fast and I don't know why you would ever use them. So uh, you're gonna start with the fine set and the fine set is what's uh, installed on the machine, in this case, from the factory. 
And so this tells you uh, what your actual feed rates are for both turning and facing because this machine also has power cross feed. Now on these tables here for a given gear set, there are three options, C, A, and B, and those correspond to the quick change gearbox. So for a given set of change gears, you've got three feed speeds, and this chart tells you precisely what those feed rates are. Now these units here are in thousandths of an inch per rotation of the spindle, which is a very logical way to measure feed rate, and here's why. We measure feed rate in distance traveled per rotation of the spindle because as you recall from the surface finish video, the lathe is always cutting a helix. And like I said at the top of the show, ultimately what we care about here is the surface speed of the cutting tool over the material. However, you know, people think of RPM as being the only thing that contributes to surface speed, that and diameter, but in fact, the feed rate also contributes to that. And as you remember from your junior high math classes, you know, we've got two vectors to get the final velocity, you add them together. So in this case, we've got uh, one vector here coming from the spindle RPM uh, that's, you know, contributing to our velocity. And then you've got a second vector here that's coming from your power feed rate contributing to your velocity. And so this uh, the sum of these two vectors is ultimately going to be your surface feet per minute, and this is what we care about. So part of the reason that we start with power feed rate uh, in this calculation is because we have less control over that. RPM, we have lots and lots of choices, but uh, power feed rate is much more limited. But we do have a couple of choices, you know, on this machine that I'm demonstrating, we have three choices for power feed rate. So how do we choose between them? Well, there are three things that go into our decision for feed rate. First is, once again, how big a hurry we're in. If we have a lot of material to remove, we want to be feeding as fast as possible. Uh, two is the power of the machine. Uh, the, uh, the feed rate is limited by the horsepower of the machine and uh, how aggressively you know, it can pull that cutter through the material. And the third main factor is surface finish. Now recall from the surface finish video that one of the main contributors to surface finish is the radius on the nose of your cutting tool. And what I said in that video is that the effect of the nose radius is basically to smear the thread cutting lines that would otherwise exist if the tool was sharp nosed. Again, since the lathe is cutting a helix, a nose radius kind of blurs the lines. Well, now that we're trying to choose feed rate, it's time to get technical about this. For best possible surface finish, the rule of thumb is that you want your feed rate to be less than half the radius on the nose of your tool. And that ensures that each lap around that helix, some portion of this curve is gonna be there to smear out the the tool marks from the previous pass. So guesstimating this guy with the calipers, this particular tool has a nose radius between 10 and 15 thou. So I'd be looking for a feed rate somewhere like five thou or below for maximum surface finish. So if I'm setting up to do a finishing pass with that tool I just showed, we know that we want a power feed rate somewhere five thou or below. So looking at my chart here, I know I'm in the fine feed gear range on this machine because I'm not insane. And so on the turning section here, I've got three options. I've got 10 thou per revolution or five or two and a half thou. So I'm gonna theoretically wanna be in the A or C range, five or two and a half thou. But uh, for finishing, I'm always gonna go with the C range because that's gonna ensure that each lap around that material is gonna be within my nose radius. Once again, grounding tools by hand, it can be tricky to know exactly what your nose radius is. So just go as fine as you can for finishing. But once again, for this exercise, we're trying to determine the upper bounds, how aggressive we can be with all the variables for speeds and speeds. So uh, we're, we're going to resume our calculations using this 10 thou feed rate. So let's summarize that whole process for one material. We'll use steel. So I've established my depth of cut. The maximum that I can do is 40 thou, the most I'm comfortable with. And my feed rate, the maximum on that machine is gonna be 10 thou per revolution. So I go to my materials chart here in Machinery's Handbook, and let's take this 120 surface feet per minute number as my baseline. And then I multiply that base speed by this scaling factor for my feed rate, which is 10 thou, so that tells me that uh, I can increase that speed by 1.08, and this reflects the difference between the 12 thou feed rate that the table is calibrated for and the 10 thou rate that I'm going to be using. And then we look up my depth of cut and we find that there's an additional scale factor of 1.15 because this 47 thou depth of cut is going to be uh, quite a bit less than the 125 that the original table is calibrated for. So with our depth of cut and our feed rate established, the final step is convert that surface speed that we derived into a spindle RPM. And this is done based on the diameter using this chart here. So I like to do this for a one inch diameter. So that's gonna be the diameter of the stock for the lathe or the cutter for the mill. And one inch is kind of a nice 
average uh, of things you're going to be working with in a hobby shop. And then you can mentally fudge these numbers up or down for smaller or larger stock or cutters. So for steel, for example, we're typically going to end up in this surface speed range. So we're going to end up somewhere between like 450 and 800 RPM. So a great exercise is to calibrate your lathe based on this data. So starting with the surface feet per minute baselines on those other charts, which again are for an eighth inch depth of cut and a 12th thou feed rate, and then modify those numbers using this chart for you know, the maximum depth of cut that your lathe can handle in each of those materials, and then modify it again for whatever your fastest feed rate is that you're gonna use. And that's gonna give you the upper bounds of uh, RPM and feed rate for each of your materials, and then you can kind of go down from there. Now that's a lot of fooling around, uh, so I've done that math for you for a typical benchtop, you know, hobbyist lathe in the nine or 10 inch swing range. And uh, if you have larger machines, these numbers will still work. They'll be, you know, more conservative than you need. For steel, your base speed is 120. For a roughing pass of 40 thou depth of cut and 10 thou feed rate, you want 500 RPM. A finishing pass of 10 thou or less, that's a two and a half thou feed rate, 800 RPM. For aluminum, your base speed is 500. For a roughing pass of 60 thou depth of cut, that's a 10 thou feed rate, you want 2000 RPM. Finishing pass of 10 thou or less, you want a two and a half thou feed rate and as much RPM as you can muster. For brass, your base speed is 350. For a roughing pass of 60 thou depth of cut and a 10 thou feed rate, you want 1400 RPM. For a finishing pass of 10 thou or less, you want a two and a half thou feed rate and as much RPM as you can muster. Okay, so let's see what those numbers actually look like on the machine. So this is the roughing pass that I just calculated for you in steel. And uh, this is definitely what I would consider the most aggressive cut that I would ever do on this machine in steel. It uh, looks pretty calm on video, but uh, in real life, uh, there's a lot of noise, a lot of smoke, and uh, overall, quite a lot of drama. You can see when I wind the cutter back how it drags a fair bit on the surface and that spring pass tells you how much load there was on that cutter because it sprung back quite a bit once that cutting force was removed. And here you can see that the chip action there is okay, it's not breaking as soon as it should. The grind on my tool might not be perfect, might need honing, but it goes to show why I don't typically run the machine this hard. Now let's see if we can clean up that finish using the finishing pass numbers that I just showed you. And that's pretty good, but I think we can do better. So just to show you the effect that speeds and feeds have on your surface finish, here's a little higher RPM and a finer cut. This is a 5 thou depth of cut. And that's a very fine finish indeed, for mild steel anyway. And here's a roughing pass with those brass numbers. Now you can tell when you're really pushing brass because it squeals like a banshee. Now let's see what happens if we push it too hard. So this is that same 10 thou feed rate, but I've put some aluminum shims in there so the chuck doesn't have as good a grip. And you can see that the force of the feed rate is actually pushing the part into the chuck and it's caused it to lose its tail support. And uh, well, everything's gone pear-shaped, quite literally. You can see in addition to the dreadful finish that there's a taper in there that's been introduced because the part got pushed out of the tailstock. Just to show you how much wiggle room there can be in these numbers, here's that same 60 thou depth of cut, very rigid setup, sharp nosed tool, mind you, but a very fine feed, the finest this machine will do. And look at how nice that finish is. That's actually quite a good final finish for this part. So uh, as you can see, play with the numbers and you'll find that there's maybe more possibilities than you thought. Quick sidebar, note that that wasn't actually 1400 RPM, as I said in the numbers, that was actually 1000 RPM, because on my lathe that's as high as I can go without moving the drive belts. So uh, it just goes to show that there's a fair amount of wiggle room in these numbers, especially at the higher RPM ranges. Now let's look at the other extreme. Here's a tool with a huge nose radius, and I'm doing a very light pass, extremely fine feed, and extremely high RPM. And that finish is like a mirror. This is probably the best finish that you're gonna get right off the machine without any kind of polishing. So play with the extremes of the numbers just to see what's possible. You might be surprised. Just to drive this point home, let's take a look at these parts under the macro lens. So here's the roughing pass that we did on the brass, and you can really see the tool marks there very clearly from that sharp nose tool. And the aggressive feed is also gonna make this effect much worse. But now let's look at that finishing pass that we did with the exaggerated round nose tool. And this finish is so good that the camera, the macro lens on the camera actually has trouble focusing. It can't quite resolve the surface on it. Now over here on the steel, this is the finishing pass and 
It's definitely good for Mild Steel, but uh, it's not going to win any Mirror Awards. Pop Quiz, what do you think is the biggest contributor to tool wear? Is it Depth of Cut? No, it is Surface Speed. This is an extremely important topic in a production CNC shop, so much so that the big book devotes an entire section to calculating it, full of lots of more tables. In the hobby shop, this doesn't matter a whole lot, but be aware that the tables in the big book are calibrated for 15 minutes of tool life. So if you want your tools to last longer than that, eh, slow things down a bit. So that's the complete process of determining speeds and feeds for your particular cutting setup from first principles. Now, why doesn't anybody actually do it that way? At least not on YouTube. Well, first of all, it's a lot of fooling around. It's a lot of math. It's a lot of looking up tables in this very expensive book. So people have shortcuts. And the most common shortcut that you'll see is this one. You take your surface feet per minute for the material from the big book here or from a chart that was most likely copied from the big book. And you just simply take that speed, multiply it by four, divide it by the diameter of your stock or your cutter. And this mostly works and it's mostly fine. But why does that mostly work? Because it's obfuscating all of these very important cutting conditions that we talked about, like depth of cut and feed rate and surface finish and so on. Well, because people are taking those numbers from these charts in Machinery's Handbook, again, which are calibrated for an eighth inch depth of cut and a 12 thou per revolution feed rate, but ignoring that calibration and using lower depths of cut and lower feed rates in general, at least in the hobby shop. And the end result is that if you use that shortcut formula, you're running slower than necessary. And that's mostly fine. You know, running slower to a point is always okay and uh, can be more pleasant for the hobby shop. You know, it's sort of less dramatic. There's less heat, less smoke, less, you know, noise from the machine, less wear and tear on the machine. So, you know, running slower is okay. And these formulas uh, work for most people because of that, because they are underestimating the uh, ultimate speeds and feeds that you know you can use uh, on your particular cutting setup. So feel free to use those shortcuts, but I think it's helpful to understand where they come from. And I do think it's a useful exercise to go through this calibration that I described for your particular machine and kind of know what that upper bound is and uh, kind of work down from there to wherever you feel comfortable uh, on speed and feed for your particular machines. We've been focusing mainly on the lathe here because it's easier to understand, but uh, uh, feeds and speeds on the mill has a lot more nuance. In modern milling operations, the unit that we use to measure speeds and feeds is a little different. Here we talk about inches per tooth. Inches per tooth refers to the amount of material that's scooped out by each tooth as it comes around and goes through the work. And this is a combination of three variables. First of all, the power feed rate, how fast the stock is being pushed through the cutter by the power feed. And then it's also a function of the RPM, which is controlling how quickly these teeth are coming around relative to that table feed. And this is also affected by the number of flutes on the cutter because of course, the more teeth you have coming around, the less each tooth gets to take for a given table feed and RPM. Inches per tooth is a very valuable and important metric on modern CNC machining where you can tightly control all these variables for optimum performance. On the manual mill and especially the hobbyist manual mill, don't really have the luxury of all that data. Because while we can control a lot of these variables like depth of cut and number of flutes and RPM, the table feed rate is a lot more tricky because either you're feeding manually, in which case your feed rate is, you know, however good your arm is feeling that day, or you're using some sort of uh, power feed. Now on some larger mills, if the power feed is driven via transmission, you might have known gearing and there may be, may be markings on your power feed controls that tell you, you know, say an, uh, an inch per minute rate for feed. Uh, but on a lot of mills, you've got an electric power feed like this almost certainly. And uh, it's got these utterly decorative numbers on the dial here that don't mean anything. So uh, how do you calculate feed speed? So this process is uh, simply a matter of zeroing out your hand wheel. Make sure you take out the uh, backlash in that guy as well. Zero that guy out. And then you need to know how many thousandths are on one full revolution. So this particular mill has 100 thou on one revolution. And you're just simply going to run your power feed for a fixed amount of time, say 10 seconds, and just see how far it went. So for the current setting on that power feed knob, it went 380 thou in 10 seconds, which is two and a quarter inches per minute, give or take. So now you can kind of map that speed to this knob. So I don't know, let's say the four is up. So you might call four, two and a quarter inches. And you know that, you know, smaller numbers are going to be less than that. And larger numbers are going to be more than that. But you don't know that the scale is linear. It may not be. And there's no kind of markings or anything on here. So 
eh, honestly, this whole exercise is a little fruitless on these uh, crappy hobby power feeds. So what I would suggest is just set it low. However, the good news is you can pretty much gloss over that nuance for the most part and use the same rules of thumb, same formulas, same numbers, uh, just using the diameter of your cutter uh, instead of the diameter of the stock. However, it is worth being aware of some of this nuance so that you can fudge the numbers up and down a little bit as needed. For example, if you're face milling, it's clearly going to make a difference if your end mill is fully engaged or you know, is only engaged uh, on a little bit of the material. You know, all this is going to affect tool pressure and thus, you know, how hard you can push your surface speed. And it matters if you're climb milling or conventional milling, but I'll be covering some of those details in the mill skills series. But then if you're doing things like slot cutting, it gets even more complicated because you've got one side conventional milling and one side climb milling. So the differential forces on the cutter complicate all these variables. And if you really want to get into it, Machinery's Handbook does have tables for all of this, including, you know, adjustment factors to feeds and speeds based on slot cutting or different levels of engagement of the face mill. Uh, but uh, you really don't need to do that for hobby work. So I hope you found this useful. Please do like, subscribe, comment, etc. And uh, consider supporting me on Patreon. And we'll see you next time.